welcome to Moody Institute of Science. Are you interested in the future? Most of us are. But uh, the crystal ball in the science laboratory seems a little out of place, doesn't it? Well, it is out of place. Here's something else that some people feel is out of place in the science laboratory, and it also is concerned with the future. Did you know that more than one-third of this book is prophecy, detailed, specific prophecy concerning the future? Now the question is, is the Bible and the crystal ball the same? Are they equally out of place here? Well, there's a way to find out. We can bring scientific tests to bear upon this book to find out if the prophecies are actually true. And we're going to use the science of history and mathematics. By way of preparation, I recently spent several months visiting many of the places and nations that are prominent in Bible prophecy. The journey was not an easy one, for these places are scattered across thousands of miles of the turbulent Middle East. From the cool waters of the Mediterranean, down through the burning sands of the deserts of Arabia, to the far distant land of Iraq. But of all the places I visited, none plays a greater role in Bible prophecy than the ancient city of Jerusalem. Sacred to millions of Jews, Muslims, and Christians, Jerusalem is a city that 40 centuries of time and conquering armies could not trample into oblivion. But despite its long and tragic history, Jerusalem lives on as a principal scene and subject of Bible prophecy. One of the most startling and unusual of these prophecies has to do with the walls and gates to the city. Bounded by walls on every side, Jerusalem can be entered only by one of several gates. Among these, the Dung Gate, Zion Gate, Jaffa Gate, New Gate, Damascus Gate, Herod's Gate, St. Stephen's Gate, and the Golden Gate. In biblical times, the Golden Gate entered directly into the court of the Temple of Solomon. It was the most important gate to the city. Because of this, it's not at all surprising to find that it's the subject of Bible prophecy. In Ezekiel, the 44th chapter, we read in the first verse, then he brought me back by the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary, which looketh toward the east, and it was shut. Then saith the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut, and it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. For six hundred long years, the prophecy remained completely unfulfilled. And then on one spring day, about A.D. 30, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Israel, entered through the gate. And so the first part of the prophecy was fulfilled, but the second part seemed utterly incredible. Remember, the Golden Gate, later, when Jerusalem was controlled by the Arabs, the Temple of Solomon was destroyed, entered now directly into the court occupied by the Dome of the Rock, or the Mosque of Omar. Since the building's completion, it has drawn faithful Muslims from all parts of the world. They come here to bow down to Allah, to offer prayers to Allah in the shadow of their sacred shrine. Because the Dome of the Rock could be most easily reached through the Golden Gate, it was logical that the gate should remain open. Certainly, the Muslims had no reason to close the gate. In the 16th century, the Sultan Suleiman decided to rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem, and along with it, the Golden Gate. Uh, when he rebuilt the Golden Gate, an amazing, incredible thing happened. Immediately after the gate was restored, he had it shut, walled up with blocks of stone. Rebuild the gate, 
and then wall it shut, it seemed impossible. And yet it happened. One thing is certain. Every other gate to Jerusalem has remained open. Herod's gate, St. Stephen's gate, Damascus gate, even the tiny dumb gate. But the golden gate, the most important gate of all, fulfills to the letter the words of a prophecy made 25 centuries ago. This gate shall not be opened. The Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. This is just one prophecy in the Bible. There are, of course, hundreds of others every bit as amazing. For example, about a hundred miles south of the city of Jerusalem is the city of Petra, one of the strangest cities in the world. In Bible times, it was referred to as Sela, and the general region as Mount Seir. Now, there are no broad highways to Petra, only a narrow trail that winds through the tortuous El Cid Canyon, whose walls of rock rise sharply hundreds of feet toward the sky. For more than a mile, El Sikh is a dream world of murky shadows and eternal silence. And then, a gigantic temple, not built of wood or stone, but sculpted from the rose-red rock of a mountainside. It is the legendary Kaznet Baru. But there is more to come, on through another canyon, till it widens into a tremendous valley and carved in the cliffs of the valley are the temples, the palaces, and the tombs of Petra. Year after year, Petra expanded in size and power, for it commanded the caravan routes that channeled the treasures of Arabia and the Far East to the hungry markets of Greece and Rome. But as Petra's wealth and culture grew by leaps and bounds, the city grew even more swiftly in pride, arrogance, and cruelty. Symbolic of Petra's wickedness are the relics of its religion. Giant obelisks cut from a mountaintop to honor Dushara, the god of the sun. Altars of stone and a pool. What was it for? The Bible says these people shed innocent blood. Perhaps this pool was a labor where priests of Dushara could wash off the blood of human sacrifice. Protected by the narrow gateway to their city, the Petrans felt confident that no one could despoil them of their treasures, nor punish them for their sins. But the prophecies of God rang out against the pagan city. O thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, that holdest the height of the hill, though thou shouldst make thy nest as high as the eagle, I will bring thee down from thence, saith the Lord. Centuries passed. It seemed that Petra would endure forever. But neither time nor circumstance could thwart the fulfillment of prophecy. And it all happened so simply. A new trade route opened up. A route that bypassed Petra in favor of Palmyra, a city to the north. Here was the blow that cut the proud city to the heart. As Petra's commerce, her life's blood began to drain away. Soon, the people left the houses they had labored so long to build. They abandoned their temples and the tombs of their dead. They emptied the great amphitheater, whose tears they had hammered and chiseled from solid rock. Imagine the tremendous effort to strip away a whole mountainside, to remove ton after ton of rock. And then, imagine the amphitheater jammed with thousands of Petra's citizens. How they would have laughed to hear some prophet foretell the desertion of their city. Yet today, the prophecies have come true. And the only spectators left are a flock of goats. Reminders of Isaiah's prediction. The wild beasts of the desert shall meet with the wolves, and the wild goat shall cry out to his fellow. A few birds nest among the ruins, for, as the Bible foretold, the owl and the raven shall dwell in it. There shall the vultures be gathered. Thus saith the Lord, thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof. 
So again, Bible prophecy is fulfilled. Not by mighty armies, nor by great battles, but simply by the change of a trade route. The city of rock, built to last forever, has become a lifeless valley, filled with the tumbled wreckage of Petra's glory. 600 miles from the hidden city of Petra flow the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, watering the ancient land of Mesopotamia. The finest city to grow up in this fertile plain was Babylon, a city of such wonder and luxury that King Nebuchadnezzar could boast, is not this great Babylon that I have built. Of Babylon's past greatness, only fragments remain. Sections of a highway that once trembled with Nebuchadnezzar's armies. Remnants of a city wall once acclaimed the finest ever built. And the worn and faded symbols of imperial splendor. Babylon's rise had been swift. But as she soared to dizzy heights of strength and beauty, she also slipped ever deeper into the mire of lust and perversion. For this, her doom was sealed. And it shall come to pass that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolation. For many years it seemed that the prophecy was not going to be fulfilled. In fact, for more than half a century, Babylon reigned as queen city of the civilized world. Then, one October night in 539 B.C., the royal banquet hall of Babylon rang with the sound of laughter and shouting. Belshazzar, the king, was holding a great feast. Suddenly, the tumult gave way to a deathly silence. As the fingers of a hand appeared and wrote these words, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Upharsi. God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. To those who rode the crest of Babylon's greatness, the prophecy must have seemed incredible. But that very night, the night of Belshazzar's feast, the Medes and the Persians entered the city. Belshazzar was slain. The empire was divided. And Babylon, once powerful, prosperous, and proud, began to melt into a desolation, a dry land, and a desert. Now Babylon is a place for foxes to dig holes, a place for jackals to scurry across barren hillsides, a place for storks to come and build their nests. All these in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. For more than 2,000 years, the ruins of Babylon have borne silent testimony to the accuracy of Bible prophecy. The land shall tremble in sorrow, for every purpose of the Lord shall be performed to make the land of Babylon a desolation without an inhabitant. Along with Jerusalem, Petra, and Babylon, the famous merchant center of Tyre was also given an important place in Bible prophecy. The prophecies about Tyre are quite remarkable. In fact, they are the most amazing set of prophecies in all of history. Let me read them to you. In Ezekiel chapter 26, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He shall slay thy people by the sword, and thy strong garrisons shall go down to the ground. Behold, I will cause many nations to come up against thee, and they shall lay thy stones thy timber, and thy dust in the midst of the water. And I will make thee like the top of a rock. Thou shalt be a place to spread nets upon. Thou shalt be built no more, for I, the Lord, have spoken it. In 586 BC, Tyre came under attack by Nebuchadnezzar. Eventually, his troops smashed their way into the city. But by then, the people had escaped with their treasure to an island just off the coast. Here, the invaders were halted. They had no ships to carry them out to the island. Now, the city lay in ruins for some 240 years, and the people continued to live on the island there with their treasure. 
Then finally, in 333 B.C., Alexander the Great marched his armies up against the city of Tyre. Of course, he found the city in ruin. But he couldn't attack the island because the people, forewarned, had built a strong underwater network so cunningly contrived that the rise and fall of the tide couldn't choke them with sand. One look at these rugged barriers was enough for Alexander. He saw at once that if he attacked by sea, his invasion craft would be smashed to bits. The people on the island breathed a little easier. It seemed that their enemy was stalemated. And yet Alexander was not easily discouraged. He conceived a very spectacular plan of battle, one that has never been equaled in history. He decided to build a roadway from the mainland out to the island march his troops across this roadway through the sea and capture the island. But where was he to get the amount of material necessary? Well, the answer was obvious. The material from the ancient city of Tyre. And so he put his armies to work. And stone by stone and brick by brick and timber by timber, the whole of that city was thrown into the sea, literally. And when that wasn't enough, they even scraped the dust and threw it into the sea to make the roadway to the island. And so, exactly as predicted, they left the site of Tyre as flat and barren as the top of a rock. Today, centuries of drifting sand have covered Alexander's causeway. The fulfillment of prophecy has actually transformed the geography of Lebanon. And what was once an island is now part of a broad peninsula. On the tip of the peninsula is a small town that now carries the name of Tyre. But this town is built on what used to be the island and not a part of ancient Tyre. The large and powerful city of ages past is gone. Today, on the spot where Tyre stood, humble fishermen come to ply their trade. Tyre, the city of the finest seamen, the wealthiest merchants, the bravest explorers, has become, as the Bible foretold, a place for the spreading of nets. Ancient Tyre has never been rebuilt. Though it has a fine location for commerce, rich, fertile land, and the fresh water of Ras Elaine Springs, more than enough to meet the needs of a great city. For down through the centuries echoes the Bible's unshakable prophecy against Tyre. Thou shalt be built no more, for I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, the detailed accuracy with which these prophecies have been fulfilled is really quite amazing, isn't it? How do you explain it? Well, for some people, the explanation is really quite simple. Their theory is that the prophets were just lucky. They made a lot of wild guesses, and they just happened to come true. If that's the case, just how lucky would these prophets have had to be? Is there an answer to this question? Yes, in fact, there is an entire branch of mathematics devoted to solving problems of just this type. It's that branch which deals with the theory of probability. And we are extremely fortunate in having an expert in the field of mathematics here to help us understand this. Professor Peter W. Stoner. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Sit down, won't you? Professor Stoner has been the head of the Department of Mathematics and Astronomy at Pasadena City College for many years, and uh, more recently at Westmont College in Santa Barbara. Professor Stoner, in addition to being an expert in the field of mathematics, has also had another interest that particularly fits our subject, for he's been interested in Bible prophecy. Uh, Professor, that book of yours, Science Speaks, has been a very great help to me personally and it's also helped us a lot in preparation of the material for this particular subject. Well, it's very gratifying. Uh, can you tell us just a bit about this theory of probability and how it works? Certainly, Dr. Moon. The principle of probability is really very simple, and we can illustrate it in many different ways. Such as? Well, let's take the case of probability where we're dealing with independent events. Mm -hmm. And say we illustrate by asking the question, what is the chance of a man becoming bald and losing a finger? Well, those are unrelated events, aren't they? Yes, they certainly are. And if we know the chance of each one occurring, 
we can compute the chance that they will both happen to the same person. Let me illustrate. Let us just suppose that one man in ten goes bald. And that one man in hundred sometime loses a finger. Then the probability that one man will both become bald and lose a finger is the product of these two, or one in ten times one in a hundred, which is one in one thousand. So the rule is, if we want the probability of a series of independent events happening, we first establish estimates of the fulfillment of each event. Then we multiply the results, and we obtain the probability that the whole series will come true. Exactly how do you apply this to Bible prophecy? I took several prophecies and submitted them to some 12 different classes, representing some 600 college students, and ask them to carefully examine the prophecies and produce the estimates that they thought were conservative. After about a year's research, they come up with values affecting the prophecies, and the particular ones which you have used are as follows. The probability of the Golden Gate prophecy coming true was about one in 1,000. To arrive at this, the student had to estimate how many gates out of all the ancient wall cities were sealed up. The prophecy with respect to Mount Seir and its capital, Petra, being conquered was given as estimate of one in ten. The probability of its laying desolate thereafter was given as one in fifty. The probability of its never being re-inhabited was given as one in one hundred. With respect to Babylon, the probability of its being destroyed was agreed upon as one in ten. That it would never be re-inhabited as one in one hundred. The chance that Tyre would be destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar was agreed upon as one in two. The chance that other nations would participate in the destruction was given as one in five. The chance that its stones, timbers, and dust would be laid in the sea was given as one in ten. The chance that it would be made flat like the top of a rock as one in two thousand. The chance that it would later become a place for the spreading of nets as one in ten. The chance that it would never be rebuilt as one in twenty. I see. Well, then your next step would be to calculate the probability of all the prophecies coming true. That's right. Now, obviously, these are not precise figures but only crude guesses. There are also problems associated with selecting prophecies and with the possible dependency of the events. But to get some idea of what is involved in fulfilled prophecies, we multiply these together and come out with the tremendous figure of one in two quintillion. Of course, that is a chance so small that it is quite impossible for the human mind to conceive of it. Yes, let's try. Let's suppose we had two quintillion silver dollars. And we marked one of those silver dollars, stirred it into the whole mass. Then we took all of these silver dollars to the state of Texas. Texas has an area of a little more than a quarter of a million square miles. We will spread our silver dollars out on the surface of Texas. They will cover the entire state of Texas to a depth of about 35 feet. Now we will blindfold a man and send him out to get that silver dollar. He may travel as far as he wishes across Texas. He may dig as deep as he pleases. But at the end, he must come up with a silver dollar and say, this is it. What chance does he have? Well, it is about the same chance that we would have of your prophecies coming true, 
providing they were written in human knowledge. But they did come true to the very last minute detail. Thank you so much, Professor Stoner. That's been a wonderful help. The accuracy of Bible prophecy is an amazing thing. So far as I know, there is not one bit of Bible prophecy up to this point that has not been fulfilled. And to me, this is the strongest evidence of the divine origin of this book. But the prophecies in the Bible do not concern cities and nations and people alone. Oh, there's even more about nations and people just ahead, for this book is far more up to date than tomorrow morning's newspaper. But even more important are the prophecies in this book concerning your future and mine. Where are they? They run from the beginning of the Bible clear through to the end. Now, I'm not going to attempt to interpret them for you or even to read them to you. I'd like to help you find them, though. The Gospel of John is a particularly good place to start, for it tells us much about where we're going to spend eternity and why. In the first chapter, for example, but to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And then in the third chapter, the 36th verse, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And so on, through the book, page after page, until we come to the next to the last chapter. And we read in the 31st verse, But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, ye might have life through his name. Yes, this is the most important book in all the world. It tells us not only where we came from, what we're doing while we're here, but it also tells us where we're going. May I suggest that this book should be your prime study in these important days.